Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me on a Saturday. I'm going to be talking about some work we did with Muskellunge in Canada's historic Rideau Canal. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be calling them musky. Um, I just want to start off by acknowledging that this is one of those projects that really takes a massive amount of help. It was an awesome time going out with Muskies Canada Inc., which is an angling group in Ottawa. Um, they helped a lot with capturing, and I had tons of help from the field and from my advisors. So Canada is, can be really beautiful in the winter, um, but this is a really ecologically challenging season for a lot of our freshwater aquatic species. Um, it involves low and freezing temperatures. It can involve lower river flows and also ice phenomena. And all of these things can result in reduced suitable winter habitat. It can decrease connectivity and systems. Uh, and sometimes if things become really harsh, then winter kill events can occur. Uh, and winter has been, um, there's some research that suggests that winter can be more challenging for larger fish, like this beautiful muskie here you see. Um, now, typically, we think about critical habitat protection as being a really great way to protect biodiversity, and critical habitat being things like nursery areas, spawning habitats. Um, in Canada, Species at Risk Act does note these different kinds of habitats as ways to conserve biodiversity and try to save these species that are in decline. Um, but, you know, there's no specific mention of, of winter as being a critical habitat to our fish in Canada. And this is inherently critical because if fish don't have a place to overwinter, they're not gonna survive and those populations are gonna experience declines. Um, now, you guys have probably seen this graph before, but the World Wildlife Fund um, Living Planet Index puts out these, uh, they monitor freshwater populations globally. And uh, they have documented about an 84% decline in freshwater species worldwide. Um, now, a group of experts came together. They, uh, they published this paper called Bending the Curve of Global Freshwater, Freshwater Biodiversity Loss. Uh, and they list these six key actions that we can take to not only stop species populations from declining, but to really bring their populations back. And one of them being to protect and restore critical habitats. Um, I would argue we also have to first identify them. So uh, for this talk, I want you to kind of reframe your perspective of only protecting critical habitats of species that are at risk, um, especially in these systems where a lot of our, our fish are already facing these interactive and persistent threats, that their populations are going through these pressures. So protecting critical habitats of these animals uh, should be equally important in order to ensure that they don't end up at listed. Uh, and this is a proactive strategy. Now, I work in Canada's historic Rideau Canal. Uh, this is located in Eastern Ontario. It's a 202 kilometer long navigable route uh, that connects Lake Ontario to the Ottawa River and it's interconnected by 24 operating lock stations. Um, the high point in the system, so it's kind of, uh, it's graded on this elevation. The high point is here where this red star is at Newborough Lake. And then water flows northwards towards Ottawa from there or southwards towards Kingston. So just keeping in mind the flow direction in the system. Um, muskie are found here in the northern portions of the Rideau Canal. Uh, it's also called the Rideau River. So muskie are ecologically important as top predators. Uh, they're also a really recreationally important iconic sport fish that anglers and um, people come from all over to try to catch them. Um, and the IUCN lists uh, several different threats that are putting pressures on these populations. And that includes natural system modifications like dams and water management, uh, invasive species and disease and pollution. And all of these are really, really relevant to the Rideau Canal. Um, they're ongoing issues that we know need to be addressed. Um, now I would love to look at uh, musky movement patterns all throughout uh, the Rideau River, but I'm just one PhD student. So we selected this focal reach between Black Rapids Lock and the Long Islands Lock uh, to look at their movement patterns. Um, so the Rideau Canal is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which means that it's highly regulated for navigation and so that they can protect infrastructure um, that has historical integrity like the locks. Um, so Parks Canada really carefully controls the water levels, uh, but they only do this during the navigation season. Uh, and outside of the navigation season, which is what we call the drawdown season, um, these really considerable drawdowns happen during winter. So what you're looking at, this red dashed line, is what the water level would be during the navigation season. Um, and then they 
lower these water levels each winter. Uh, this is about two meters that you're looking at. Um, this is Mosquito Creek, which is an important spawning tributary for game fish and muskellunge. And again, you're looking at about a two meter draw down here. So uh, where that black dash line is normally where the water level is at. Um, and this, this area, um, this area between Black Rapids and Long Island, we refer to as the Echolands Reach because there's a nearby park called Echolands and it has invasive species like carp uh, and likely pretty soon round goby are gonna show up. Um, it does have some pretty uh, poor water quality um, and it is fragmented by these two lock stations, but we're not sure if connectivity is also minimized during the drawdown when water levels are reduced. Um, but what's likely happening is that these winter threats are exacerbating the threats that fish are already undergoing during winter. So we set out with the key goal of evaluating muskie spatial ecology during a drawdown season with some specific focuses, like which areas then are most important in supporting muskie overwintering, what environmental characteristics influence residency, and is connectivity an issue during the drawdown season? Um, I had an awesome time working with the anglers and bringing them all out together. As you can see, we had a blast. Uh, the fish lived up to its name of the fish of 10,000 casts, but it was really rewarding the first time I hooked into one. So we acoustically tagged 15 muskie. Uh, we used size specific tags. So these larger tags only went into the bigger adults. Uh, and we had a pretty good size range, including three juveniles, uh, seven sub adults, and then three adults and that um, we ended up having 13 muskie acoustically detected. And that was what I went through. Um, and I deployed 11 acoustic receivers throughout that eight kilometer reach. Uh, so to start off with which area was most important. So we worked really closely with hydraulic engineers um, to approach water level me measurements from an eco hydraulic perspective. Um, and this is what it looks like when you blend together acoustic telemetry data with water level management. So uh, each circle that you see here is one of the acoustic receivers that I deployed. If the receiver is red, that means that no fish were detected there. If it's black, it means that a fish was detected there. And the larger the circle, the more time, more fish spent there. The colors are such that they are dependent on depth. So these deeper orange and red colors indicate deeper areas. Um, and you'll notice these two X's here. Uh, and these are areas that we believe functionally fragment the system uh, during the drawdown, and I'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, but what looks like happens is once uh, come about mid-December, whatever segment, the segment one, two, or three, that the fish is in, they're restricted there until about April. Uh, and just a reminder that segment one would be most downstream as the river flows north. Um, and you should be able to tell from these larger black circles that fish spent the most time in segment two during winter. Um, but fish moved quite often within uh, that segment. So we decided to look at the river and residency patterns from a segment perspective instead of individual receiver site because fish were utilizing these whole areas and not just hanging out near one receiver. Um, so the environmental characteristics that might influence that residency we saw then. And so we looked at several different environmental characteristics and that included the drawdown, the degree of drawdown, um, benthic structure like sand versus large boulders um, and the average depth in each segment. So starting with drawdown, um, with each river segment being partitioned into these three areas, the highest drawdowns we saw were most downstream in segment one. Um, each segment was statistically distinct. Um, and interestingly, fish spent the most time in one of these areas that had really considerable drawdowns of about 2.1 meters. So we had originally predicted that these areas that have higher drawdowns, fish are gonna avoid. That was not the case. Um, what we think is happening is there's, there's a backwater effect from the Black Rapids Dam. Uh, and that's why we're seeing this higher levels of drawdown near the dam. Um, looking at benthic structure, uh, and I just want to point out in this figure, this is like the really fine scale, beautiful mapping uh, that they went out and conducted so that we could understand benthic structure in the river. And I know there's a lot going on in this figure. Um, on the y axis, you have residency index. So the higher the bar, the more time fish spent there. On the x axis, you have receiver site, um, and each receiver is grouped into those segments. So we had three different kinds of structure. 
Uh, low structure, which would be silt, sand, or clay, not much going on there. Uh, medium is things like gravel or cobble. And then high structure means that boulders were present. And in some areas, we saw boulders as small as, as, uh, as large as like a small uh, car. So there's some really big boulders in the area. Um, you should also note that there's pretty clear collinearity going on in this system. So in the segment three, which is most upstream, that's the only area we noted that has these large boulders, whereas medium structure is really only found near the Black Rapids Dam in segment one. Um, segment two is the area where fish spent the most time. And interestingly, this area was entirely composed of silt, sand, or clay. So that doesn't mean that there's no structure available. There could be woody debris or persistent vegetation throughout winter but it was mostly composed of these silty areas. Um, we did note several fish also overwintered in segment three though, where these boulders were. Uh, so it could be something else is going on. Uh, if fish can overwinter in both areas, one just might be more preferable. Um, segment depth. So we measured the Thalweg, which is the average depth along the deepest portion of the channel. Uh, and that's something that is probably pretty noticeable from looking at this graph. Um, looking at this figure, sorry, you have these really beautiful deep orange colors that are relatively continuous in segment two. Segment one on average was about three meters deep, segment two almost four, almost five meters deep on average, whereas segment three was only about 2.4 meters um, on average. So what we think is happening is that these uh, silty areas are usually um, indicating slower velocities uh, and there's this deep area, so it could just be the best suitable area that has minimal energy requirements. Um, with connectivity in the season, uh, as you know now from those X's, connectivity was an issue. Um, and these two areas appear to functionally fragment fish from passing through. What's most likely is that it's just too shallow uh, during winter. So these areas are quite shallow, about half a meter to maximum two meters in some areas. Um, this area near receiver eight also experiences really high velocities, especially during spring freshet. Uh, so it could be a, a velocity barrier. Um, and there could be an interaction between ice formations where there simply is not enough navigable space for fish to pass through. Um, but because both segments two and three provide overwintering habitat, it might not be that big a deal that we need you know, Parks Canada to go out right now and dredge and create a connection. Um, unless we start seeing winter kill events and winter kill events have been documented multiple times in the Rideau Canal. So it's something to keep an eye on um, as time goes on. Um, we did discover this fourth unintentional finding, which was not the intention, but may end up being one of our most important findings. So come early April, musky uh, about 600 millimeters and larger started showing these increased activity patterns, both upstream and downstream direction. Uh, and this really closely coincided with water temperatures reaching spawning ranges. Um, and this was as early as April 8th, which is quite early for musky spawning. But this is a potential conservation issue because this reach is not refilled until May. Um, in April, access to a lot of those littoral vegetated areas and spawning tributaries is quite limited. Um, so we're hoping that Parks Canada might consider uh, adaptive management strategies where once the risk from flooding with spring freshet uh, is minimized, you know, if they bring up those water levels sooner, it could be able to support musky populations. Um, and this will be especially important to consider uh, with climate change. Um, we did some modeling of temperatures in Ottawa over the past 50 years, uh, and it does indeed look like air temperatures are steadily increasing over time. Uh, so some quick uh, summaries. We did identify the critical overwintering habitat, which was primarily in that middle portion, that middle deep area of the river. Uh, there does appear to be sufficient overwintering habitat, which is great. That was our key concern. Um, the river is fragmented during drawdown, so if we start seeing winter kill events, uh, it's something to keep in mind. Um, and we saw these increased movements in April, which are likely spawning movements. Um, so I'm currently, I'm close to submitting this manuscript. This will be my second data chapter, this is just citing. Um, we're working closely with uh, water level managers with Parks Canada. Um, and this study actually is part of a big 10 year study that uh, Dr. Cook likes to call living lab. So uh, he said, you know, come back in 2030 if you want updates on this big long year connectivity study. Um, and I'm happy to, I think now starts the questions. So if you have any questions or ever wanna reach out, um, I'm always happy to chat fish. <laughs>